Uh, we've been in a series of messages uh, through the summer. We're going to be looking at different psalms, and I thank you for uh, uh, getting your psalms to me, uh, some of you, many of you. Uh, but if you haven't, then um, you still need to do it. Write your psalm. Uh, it can be as personal as you can make it, and uh, it can be uh, worshipful. It can be personal and deep. It can be angry and raging. It can be questioning. It can be celebrative. And get it to me. And uh, so thank you. And I'm going to read one today that's uh, very uh, literary. This one came in with a little note. I took your homework assignment seriously. Here's my song. This is very, this is like literature. O oh, soul within me, praise the Lord. Praise his name, for he is good. Thrice in the morning will I praise him, yea, four times will I lift my voice in praise. Who can doubt the goodness of the Lord? When I prosper, he's there. When I'm in duress, he's there. When I was young, his spirit ran with me. Now that I'm old, he walks beside me. From generation to generation, his blessings are manifest. When death hovers near, he's there. In the fullness of life, his face shines on us. Do we forget him in our distraction? Truly, he remembers us. Though I may err and choose badly, his grace is steadfast. Though I don't know where I'm going, he's leading me. I cannot but rejoice. Oft times I know not how to please him. Yet in all things, that is my desire. May the desire itself be pleasing to you, Lord. O soul within me, praise the Lord. So keep them coming, and each week we'll read one or two, and uh, keep hearing the heartbeat and the songs of, uh, of Harbor Church, really. That's what it is. Um, today, um, we're going to be looking at a song that in some ways includes all of, uh, in my mind, all the significant messages we need to be keeping in mind about our faith. It, it's a very, um, very poignant psalm. And if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Psalm 8. It's almost dead center in the Bible if you, if you need a simple direction. If you just let it flop open right in the middle, you're pretty much there. If it flopped over and you're in the maps, you're, you flopped it over wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you've ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for? Him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and all that swim in the paths of the sea. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So Lord, teach us from this psalm. Teach us how we might... Uh, worship you and learn from our whole earth's message about who you are and who we are. That's our that's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, this psalm starts out with the, the the really profound message of how majestic is your name, Lord, in all the earth. And and the reason that stands out is. All my life, it seems like I, I have weird friends, okay? And, and my friends, most of them are kind of new agey, and, they, and they, uh, they believe in a spirituality that, you know, they kind of like being spiritual, which to them means feeling emotional at a sad movie or something. But um, they uh, don't have an idea of, of a God who is personal, who they could have a relationship with, it just seems so foreign to them. And, and, and they'll often say, well, you know, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to read the Bible because, you know, when I go up in the mountains, you know, I feel spiritual. And, 
And I'd want to say, well, you know, when I eat Mexican food, I feel things too. But, <laughs> but I don't because, you know, I'm a loving pastor. But the thing is that um, this verse is the antithesis of that. You see, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That means that, that, that we worship a God that we can know and who wants us to know and who knows us. A God who has a name to be worshipped and it's not just a vague gassy spirituality. And, and that is a pivotal, pivotal uh, foundation from which we, we look at the rest of, of this psalm and the message to us. Now, psalms have been uh, teaching us over the years. I think we learn a lot through the music, right? And it teaches us in ways that uh, other studies don't. But um, I was thinking about the message of this psalm, the wonders of in the earth, you've set your glory above the heavens, uh, considering the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars are set in place, all of these things. And then I thought, wait a minute. Hundreds of years ago, we had this, we had this hymn, this psalm. For the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light, Lord of all, to these we raise this, our joyful hymn of praise. That's basically the same message, isn't it? We were worshiping uh, as we were reminded of this. And then there was one written uh, much fewer hundreds of years ago. Uh, remember, great is thy faithfulness? Um, summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars and their courses above, join with all nature in manifest witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. It's, it's teaching us that, that all of, of the created world demonstrates this, this loving God and, and leads us to worship and, and is an act of worship perhaps itself. Then there's this, uh, how great thou art. Remember that one? Yeah. Anybody got that one? Okay, so... O Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. See, this is getting cosmic. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and see the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God. Do you get the power of that? That... that we can see the created world and it, and it all joins with us in worshiping, not itself. We don't worship nature and, and not pointing to us. We don't worship ourselves, but it all joins together and leads us in worshiping the Lord. Very, very powerful. And, uh, and, and often it's a part that I, I kind of set aside because of my upbringing. But... Um, So I look at this psalm, and it's going along talking about the, the majesty of God demonstrated in, in nature, in, in the created world, right? And then it makes a pivotal jump. What is man? If you look at all the nature and everything going on, what is mankind that you would be mindful of? That you didn't even think of them, that you didn't remember them. How do we fit in? Now, this was written a few years ago, okay? And uh, before they knew this, that, uh, that we know, we all know this, okay, this is redundant. In one second, a beam of light travels 186,000 miles, which is about seven times around the earth. It takes eight minutes for that beam to go from the sun to the earth. In a year, the same beam travels almost six trillion miles. This is called a light year, and eight billion light years from Earth is halfway to the edge of the known universe. Within the universe, there are 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars on average. In all the galaxies, there's perhaps as many planets as stars, 10 billion trillion. What is man? that you would be mindful of him, right? When you think about the, the nature of our, of our cosmos and, and how insignificant we feel. In fact, I found this great quote from uh, uh, Carl Sagan. 
who was kind of the resident scientist for television for before Bill Nye, the science guy, took over. Uh, as long as there have been humans, we've searched for our place in the cosmos. Where are we? Who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star, lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe where there are far more galaxies than people. Who, who are we? Where are we? Humdrum place on the periphery. See, the psalmist says, look at the grandeur and the majesty and the cosmos and all of that that Carl Sagan looked upon and asked, what, who are we? And then wait for God to answer. Who are we? And what does this mean? Uh, Tuesday night, we, Eileen and I were, went, went over to Colorado to Red Rocks, which is this uh, natural amphitheater with these huge rock formations uh, to see James Taylor, you know, great pillar of the faith. And, uh, and you're sitting there in this amphitheater about an hour outside of Denver and unbelievable, it's hard to watch the stage because you're just looking up at the grandeur of the universe and the, and the created world. And uh, it, it's a stunning thing when you get out of your natural way of doing things and you put yourself in a place where you see things a little bit differently. And I found it to be a real worshipful concert because you're just going, wow, Lord, this is spectacular. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You know, while James is singing you know, Fire and Rain or something. And, uh, <laughs> which was good too. Um, now, let's, let's look at this, what, what is mankind? That you would remember, remember. Now, so far, every psalm that we've looked at in this series has talked about how God remembers us. Isn't that true? We talked about, I've tattooed you on the palm of my hand, remember? I've written you in my book, uh, and, and now, who, who is man that you would be mindful, that word mindful is that you'd remember, that you'd even remember, in light of, of uh, the grandeur and the beauty and the magnitude of, of the created world. Now, we need to hear the answer and we need to look at the answer to this because it has everything to do with understanding who we are and our relationship with God and our relationship with the world, which uh, we've not always done a good job of as, as Christians, right? Um, uh, there's John Calvin, I've told you this a million times, John Calvin had the greatest insight and that is there's a knowledge of mankind and there's a knowledge of God. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter which one you focus on. You could be a theologian, you could be a psychologist. He didn't say that, I, I threw that in. You could be a theologian, you could be a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and it doesn't matter because the more you understand people, the more you go to the heart of humanity, the more you're drawn to know God. And the more you study and learn and discover who God is, the more you're drawn to find out, well, well then who are we? What does God have for us? What does this mean? And so he said, it doesn't matter where you start because you're going to end up at the same place. Your relationship with God and who you are and who God is and how that works together. And, and he was brilliant to, to, to realize that. Now, it says uh, that you're mindful of him. You make, you make him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crown him with glory and honor. And you've made him to rule over the works of your hands. You put everything under, under humans' feet. All flocks and herds goes on and on. Now, I looked at this, I thought, where have I heard that before? And then I went all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. That's in the start of the Bible, by the way. <laughs> if you're at the maps, you're, you're, you're dyslexic. But this is what it says. And God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Isn't that just what the psalm said? And so God created humanity in his image. In the image of God, he created a male and female, he created them. God blessed them. You think, 
This was God's plan all the time. Now, here's the deal. Did anything go wrong? See, I, I think we need to recognize that, that when, when people, when mankind became dissatisfied with being a little less than God, like the psalm says, psalm 8 says you're a little less than God, just being a little less than God is not enough. We want to be God. And when that little less was taken away and moved up to we want to be God, all hell broke loose, literally. All hell broke loose. And, and not only did, did we fall in our sin and in our defiance and in our, our not being the people that God made us to be, our whole world began to reflect that. And, uh, and so when, in the New Testament, it's talking about when, 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 uh, when Christ breaks into our world, it says the, the whole of creation is groaning like a woman in childbirth, waiting for the redemption that, that, that Christ brings. The whole world is, is just grown. That means the created world, too, is going, boy, I wish we could get back to the garden instead of what we got now. The people have messed us up, you know. Now, what does this mean? And this is really hard for me to say because, you know, I'm, I'm a man who, who has a certain background. But I believe even though it's difficult for me to say this, I believe that maybe the time has come for followers of Jesus to step up and lead the revolution for greening of our world, for the environment, for caring for it, for stopping the abuse, for, uh, for looking th through the eyes of, our, of uh, the gifts of the, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, that we begin to treat our world the way God wants us to reflect, right, with the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I keep talking about my back. My background is that uh, it's those crazy, liberal, mindless, uh, you know, you know, who, who are all worried about the world, and, and you know, us, us <laughs> don't put your hands up, you know. <laughs> this, was, this was what I was taught in my family, you know. I, I, I became the, uh, <laughs> I became the radical, I became one of those uh, simple-minded liberals, you know, <laughs> crazy people, but, but I still had the, the kind of, I'm in control of my world that I was raised with. Now, this is kind of hard for me to share this, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my background so, and how I got there. Uh, like Eileen's a vegetarian, right? She won't eat anything that had a mother. That, that's her deal. You know, if I had a mother, I'm not eating it. You know, it's kind of like I hear the screams of sadness from all the polyesters that made up my shirt, you know. But, uh, I mean, she's very sincere about that. And uh, I'm not that way, okay? So, you know, but... Um, and the Bible talks real clearly about, you know, it's okay to eat animals if you want, it's okay not to if you don't, all those things, and, and so I understand that. But um, I grew up, uh, my father was a uh, agricultural engineer graduate from UCLA, and uh, knew about the earth and farming and ranching and livestock. He knew about all of that stuff. My mom, was from a family of West Texans who said, I will never live on a ranch. I don't care what you do. Psh, that's out. If, if there's not a Robinson's or a Bullock's or something nearby, I'm not going. And, uh, and so my dad's dream was, was halted. But that's where he began. And then we moved to Africa, deep into the jungles, where the <laughs> majesty of the world is. And it's actually a pretty dangerous place, right? Very little power out there. The jungle reclaims the land. And, uh, and he thrived there. Um, where you can just kind of make stuff work. And he had this idea that he should train his children, which included me, that we should become uh, comfortable taking care of things, ruling the earth. So we started out, we had our pets, you know, my brother had chickens, and then we had to learn how to cut off their heads and throw them and then gut them and 
pluck them and all that stuff. And he taught us how to do it. We all had to do it. And, and we thought, well, you know, it is dinner. You know, except we're in Woodier now. We're not in Africa doing this, which is seem more natural. Now we're in Woodier, California, and you can go down to the, it was the A&P market down at the end of the street and, and not have to do this. But our yard was littered with chicken heads and stuff. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this is what I grew up in, you know, my Christian home. And, and and I was okay. I didn't mind it because they were my brother's chickens. But I had this one duck named Dudley that was my pet, and he followed me around and everything. And I've already told you the story where you know one day he was disappeared, <laughs> and I searched for him all afternoon. And then that night at dinner, you know, we had the biggest, toughest chicken I'd ever eaten. In my life, you know. <laughs> And I st my eyes began to open, you know, and my other brother had rabbits. I don't even want to tell you about what was hanging on our trees. Uh, it, was, it was spooky. <laughs> the kids in the neighborhood didn't want to come into Westfall's yard. But we were learning how to rule the world, right? <coughs> then one day, I was about junior high age, I, I thought I heard gunfire. So I came out, and on the deck, my the balcony there, my, my dad was uh, shooting puppies with a twenty two rifle as they ran around and then he'd target practice them and shoot them. All of a sudden it began to change in my mind. Whoa, what just happened here? How did we go from, well, this is what we eat to this is a sport, hunting is a sport. You know, whether you hunt deer or whether you hunt uh, puppies, in our case. Um, I'm happy to say we didn't eat them that I know of. Right. There was that meatloaf, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not going there, you video people. No way. But, you know, that started to change my thinking about things. But I didn't know who I was because this was how I grew up. And then the, the day that uh, he was arrested for um, putting a litter of kittens in a bag and stomping them to death was uh, another step, you know. And when he, when he had his trial and he went before the judge, the judge asked, why would you put kittens in a bag and stomp them to death? And he thought for a minute and said, well, I didn't have any water to drown them in. And I'm thinking, what the hell? <laughs> you know, that's what I'm thinking. What happened here between uh, one with the land and prospering and growing and learning and how to survive and suddenly we move to this. And I, I realized that's exactly what the Bible tells us happened. That we went from being the steward of the land and the caretaker of the land for the Lord, you know, charged with the care of it to this land is my land, this land is my land, this land is my land. That's kind of a variation of the song. I'll do whatever the heck I want with it, land. You know? and, and so we go from um, seeing the majesty and the glory of God in the created world to stomping kittens in a bag because we can't find the water to drown them. That's the fall. That is the fall is personal to me because I moved through the progression and I had to realize my dad loved the Lord he was a missionary he made sure we all went to church and we all studied our Bibles and, and I went I'm gonna have to be a different man than I was raised I got to choose to be a different man now confession I go back to old instincts of, well, who cares? I'm in charge. You know, I, I got that Westfall trait. You know, I'm, I'm confessing that to you, not bragging about it. Um, and so, I have quandaries all the time about when do I cross the line into living out my sin, and when do I see the created world and all of it is as an amazing gift that that leads me to worship the Lord. And that points me to the God who, who remembers us, who knows us, who's tattooed our lives on his hand. You know? When do we cross that line? Um, I hear some followers of Jesus talking, uh, uh, 
crazy talk, you know. Um, they politicized the stewardship of the created world. And it's not a political issue. It's not an economic issue. It's a worship issue. That's what this is about. How do we allow the whole created world to lead us and other people to see the majesty of the name of the Lord? I don't want to be like my dad. I, I decided that. I'm probably more like him than, uh, than I'd ever admit, but I don't want to be like him. I don't want to blur the lines away and replace myself with God instead of realizing, you know, we were made a little bit lower than God and celebrating that. There's a glory in that, you know. You're a unique, unrepeatable miracle creation of the Lord, just a little bit below God. Is that okay? If it's not, we're totally screwed up. It better be okay to be a little bit lower than God. And then we can go about seeing the whole world worshiping and pointing us to the Lord. Okay, that was kind of hard for me to share that with you, but um, you know, that's what happens. So uh, it's my life. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, we thank you for forgiveness, and, and we claim it. And uh, we thank you that you don't leave us as we are, um, but you, you lead us forward with grace and hope and joy. And so um, we ask for that for every person in this room and beyond, and we ask for your, your majesty to be shown to us every day in this world that you've created and, and given to us. So walk with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.